because I found that if, if and I think this is true today still, that, that if we go to clients or prospects and and they tell us what they need, and we're just going to start chasing our tail because they have absolutely no idea what they actually need. Um, and so, and, and I think they know that too. Today, I'm so excited to be joined by John Jantz. If you don't know John, he has been in the marketing game for 30 years as a trusted advisor to small and medium-sized businesses specializing in marketing strategy, consulting, and advertising through duct tape marketing. He also has a podcast by the same name, so I'm pretty sure you've heard of him. His expertise has actually led to the publication of seven books, seven books, including the best-selling The Referral Engine, Teaching Your Business to Market Itself. John, I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Well, not as excited as I am to be here, Brooke. Oh, I love that. I'm so excited that you're excited. Now we can be excited (laughs) together. So all as always, thank you so much for being here. The first question that I want to ask, which all of you listening and watching probably know if you've been watching the show, but what made you decide to jump into owning your own agency 30 years ago? Well, I, I actually, I didn't study it necessarily in college or anything. I don't know that anybody really uh, studies anything that pre- in college that prepares them for owning their own business. Uh, but I went to work uh, out of college for an ad agency. I did it for about five years and you know, I kind of saw, well, at least my, I assumed any dummy can run a business, <laughs> you know, it's not that hard. How hard could it be? So without, you know, any planning necessarily or thoughts, I knew I could sell. I knew I could hustle work, which, you know, let's face it, that's 50% of, of this job. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're going to start your own thing. Um, and so that, that just that bit of confidence that I knew I could sell, uh, was enough for me to jump out and, and decide I wanted to do it on my own. I think I'm, like a lot of entrepreneurs that, you know, I'm kind of stubborn. I like to do things my way. And and so it uh, felt like the way to be able to get to be in charge. <laughs> I love it. And aren't we all stubborn? I think that's a great trait for <laughs> you to have if you are going to be an agency owner. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it can lead into resilience. It can lead to persistence. Yes. I mean, which those are things. I mean, obviously too much stubbornness can also get you in trouble. Yes. Uh, but, but a level of it uh, certainly can keep you going. So knowing that you've been in business for 30 years, I have to ask you, I mean, we've gone through how many changes and how many crazy changes are we going through on the daily right now? So can you (laughs) shed a little bit of light on some of the fundamental shifts that have taken place with the marketing landscape and how they've impacted the relationship between, you know, marketing agency owners and clients? Well, I actually created, I think telling you a story is probably the easiest way to tell you this. I actually created a course 20 plus years ago. Um, And the first sale of that course uh, advertised in a magazine, in the back of a magazine, Um, people would call an 800 number and listen to a recording and get and leave their address. I would send them a a free report, which was 10 pieces of paper. Um, And in that free report, there would be a, uh, what we actually called a coupon at the end where they could actually (laughs) send back in an order by check or credit card. And then I would go over to the shelf and I would get a three ring binder um, that had C CDs in it as well, uh, and I would ship that to them. The whole process took about five weeks. So wow. that, <laughs> that that probably illustrates what's changed. I mean, we didn't have the internet when I right. started, you know, my agency. Obviously, uh, email have being an everyday thing. Social media coming along, you know, mm-hmm. the the new platform of of the week uh, coming along. You know, video and what we're doing here today. None of these platforms existed. Uh, you know, we have to start by dropping uh, AI, um, you know, yeah. into the conversation, yeah. right? You know, because that's obviously kind of the the next you know big big thing. So, I mean, I the the thing I always tell people though is. You know, those are just platforms. Those are just ways people can buy. <laughs> the fundamentals of what we are meant to do as marketers hasn't changed a bit. And I think that that's, that's why somebody like me, I mean, obviously you have to evolve, you have to uh, sure. understand the new tools. But I think if, if you are based in a point of view about what marketing is and, and that it you know, begins with strategy before tactics, I think you can evolve with a, you know, every new platform. I love that answer. It's really, you know, the the mediums keep changing and getting crazier and crazier, but really the fundamentals are the same. So we were talking before this interview, and I love the fact that you you don't really see yourself as a vendor, right? You see yourself as a trusted advisor. And I'm hoping that you can share an example from your experience of 
transitioning from just being another vendor to a company to becoming a trusted advisor? Like what are the actions and the decisions that facilitated that shift? Well, there is an amount of positioning, I guess, you know, that goes around like what you're selling and who you attract, but it really started for me, you know, 20 plus years ago, I found that I loved working with small business owners. They were really Mm -hmm. very difficult to work with. I'd come from an agency, traditional agency kind of background. And, um, and so, you know, I was like, what do you need? Okay, sure. We do that. But I found that that was really tough to do with a small business because they needed everything and uh, they Mm -hmm. didn't have the same budget. They didn't have the same attention span. (laughs) You know, there was no committee (laughs) funding anything over here, you know? Um, And so I, I, it was, purely accidental. I said, look, if I'm going to work with small business owners, I have to take a whole nother approach. I have to come in and say, you know, I'm going to do this. <laughs> you know, here are the results we hope to expect. You're going to do this. You know, here's how much it costs. You know, do you want it or not? Uh, because I found that if, if, and I think this is true today still, that, that if we go to clients or prospects and and they tell us what they need, and we're just going to start chasing our tail because they have absolutely no idea <laughs> what they actually need. Um, and so, and, and I think they know that too, but if we don't actually give them the option, you know, then they're going to default to, oh, I read about this. I need that. I need this now. And so the fact that I was actually coming in and saying, you know, we're going to install a marketing system, you know, it's, um, you're going to know exactly what it's going to do. It's going to start with strategy before tactics. You're going to know what it costs. I discovered pretty quickly that that was actually music to their ears. Um, they, you know, that they were tired of the idea of the week. They were tired of everybody selling a piece of the puzzle to them. Yeah. Right. And so, so to me, I didn't necessarily say I'm going to create this whole new approach that's going to make me a trusted advisor. I just discovered that if I took that approach and I came in and I actually did, and today we we actually call it a product. We we do a strategy first engagement with every client, and it has a very set prescriptive path that allows us to deliver not only tremendous value, but it also allows us to really establish ourselves as their trusted advisor, you know, as opposed to you know the 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 vendor. And, and, you know, there are a lot of people that make a lot of money doing SEO and, and, you know, doing other things and grow great businesses. But I think it's a race to the bottom right now from a <laughs> tactic standpoint. I mean, you know, I already mentioned AI once, so this will be the second time. I mean, that you know, you've got people out there building websites for $100 and writing content for $5 and, you know, mm-hmm. using a lot of those tools. And, and if we go in, you know, and that's what we sell, uh, it's just going to be tough to make uh, any kind of profit or build any kind of business. I love that answer because um, because it, it makes so much sense to me. So, so if we're looking at the top qualities that would transition, you know, anybody who's listening who's a marketing agency and they want to transition from being a vendor or a service right. provider to a trusted advisor, I heard you kind of say two things. One was that you always come in and provide the strategy first because a lot of people, and you, at least with your customer base, right, yeah, don't yeah. know what they need. But it also sounds like implementation is really important too. You're giving them the tools to yeah. then implement that strategy. Is that correct? Well, in, in most cases, we we actually we've actually started positioning it as a fractional CMO, um, and and that's really just semantics, quite frankly, because we've been doing it forever. But all of a sudden, the market's kind of woken up to that idea of a fractional CMO yeah. and what it means. I think the pandemic really caught so many people off uh, with, a, with no tactics. I'm sorry, with no strategy at all. Uh, and so this idea of, yeah, we need some strategic help, but mm-hmm. we don't need a full-time CMO. Um, you know, I think that the market's caught up with that. Um, yeah. And so the way we kind of pitch that is, is we are your fractional CMO plus implementation. So rather than just giving them the tools, um, in most cases, you know, regardless of the size of the business, now they may have an internal team that we can help orchestrate with, but for the most part, um, what we do then, the, the, the point of doing strategy first, that engagement, which takes us about 60 days, is that's going to develop the, the roadmap for at least a year. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so, you know, we're able to show them, here's what the future is going to look like. And so it typically, it turns then into a very scope out um, long-term retainer. I love that. I love that. And they want to stay with you long-term because like you said, at this point, you have become a trusted advisor, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, People will tell you they want customers, but but they want some clarity around like where they're going, how they're different. You know, they want some confidence that like what they're doing is right and what they shouldn't be doing. You know, they want some control over their marketing. I mean, they can't really identify that, but that's what I think 
doing strategy first. Um, and that's just, I keep using that term because we actually call it that as, as a product. Um, that's what it really brings to them. They For the first time, they have some clarity around messaging and they feel like, oh, okay, you're telling me I don't have to do these things, but I do have to do these things. So I have some some confidence on what's going to work and and maybe a little control uh, that, that I know what's going to happen next month. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so we all know trust can't be formed overnight and you've got this, you know, strategy first approach, mm -hmm. but how else could you share some other strategies on how you nurture these long-term relationships with clients? Like how do you get them to stick around? Sure. I, I have to tell you, this is, this sounds really um, ridiculously simple, but uh, we over communicate. Um, mm. One of the things that I have heard time and time again, when we go in and somebody says, yeah, we used to use somebody, you know, that did our marketing, but like all they would do is give us some report that said how many hits we had, um, you know, or just whatever made up metrics they could. And, mm. you know, we, we communicate, we tell our clients what we're going to tell them. <laughs> and then we, you know, tell them what we did. And then we tell them what we're going to do. And we just communicate um, on an ongoing basis. And we make it very simple. We don't just dump 10 page reports for those that want 10 page reports, they get them, uh, but they also get uh, an overview of what those mean and why they're important and you know what they should really be looking at next. We do a quarterly planning session that is all about revisiting strategy. Most small mid-sized businesses, you know, the, the advice out there, you read books that say, you know, you need your five-year plan or your three-year plan, you know, and yeah. most businesses, 90 days is like, <laughs> let's reevaluate. Right? Yep. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I think people just get really hooked on that idea, the, the communication, the level of communication. We're constantly, we're constantly proving our worth um, in those, you know, conversations. Uh, that's another thing that, you know, a lot of, a lot of agencies, I think, sometimes struggle with it's like, yeah, we're doing what we said we would do, but the clients kind of forget. <laughs> um, and so we're, you know, we're constantly show them, showing them the value of what happened this month in terms of maybe it's leads or or conversions that that we created and the dollar you know amount that that's worth. Um, they don't, you know, when we when you do that, they don't look at your invoice every month and go, what are we getting for this? Uh -huh. I mean, you, you've made it really clear. I love that. Do you have any quick tips? Just going off of that question, how can anybody who's listening or watching, how can they take the data that they are, you know, sure. uh, ret retrieving for their clients on, on their client's behalf and tell the story or be more valuable, like you're saying? Sure. Any kind of ideas there? Uh, you know, I'm not a data nerd by any means. I just know that there are some basic things that, you know, if we set up goals in analytics, if we, um, if we're able to create attribution to, to really prove this thing did this thing, mm -hmm. um, even if it's like call tracking or something like that, you know, yeah. on a very basic level. Uh, that's what we really try to focus on. Um, I, there are some other metrics that are important. They show growth. They show we're moving in the right direction. You know, they show engagement maybe in, in, in social media, for example, um, that, that people do like to see. But, but, my experience is ultimately they like to see, did this lead to any growth in dollars? <laughs> did this lead to growth <laughs> in customers? So we definitely try to figure out, not only figure out how to measure that, but put put some things in place. You know, I mentioned call tracking is one of my yeah. favorites that, that, that allow us to go see <laughs> this generated a customer. Yeah. Well, that's automatic value, right? You can't yeah. argue with that. So you've managed to maintain this trust advisor, you know, term, uh, status title, yeah. whatever you want to call it for so long. And even when all of these marketing trends are evolving and client demands are getting crazier and crazier, maybe it's just me. So <laughs> what strategies would you say you have for, um, you know, maintaining that trusted advisor title or status even when the client's being extremely demanding or changing their mind every day? Um, you know, I, I do, I'm sorry to hesitate there, Brooke, but we don't get very many demands out of clients that's, that way, that's uh, changing their mind. And it's partly, I think, because of the way we sell them um, and, and convert them. So it really, the relationship you have with a client starts, you know, the the day you are actually first talking to them about what you possibly could do. We don't we don't do sales meetings. We actually run people through a process. Uh, we call the marketing hourglass, which is uh, essentially our customer journey. Um, and what it does is it starts without us trying to sell anything. It starts the process of education and how we're different. Um, mm -hmm. And it and it reveals the massive gaps <laughs> that they have in their marketing <laughs> today. Um, mm -hmm. And and so they're literally saying how could you fix that for me? Um, and then we go, oh, well, we do 
have a way to do that. Um, so I think that that, you know, it, it starts with who you're attracting, how you attract them, <laughs> you know, the reason that they decided you were the one to solve their problem. Um, I, and I know that, you know, when somebody's coming to you and saying, I need you to do my marketing, um, you know, it's hard to, hard to say, you know, we're really going to screen those people out. But I think effective marketing, effective messaging, you know, staying true to a point of view and to a process really has the impact of doing that. Um, and that I think really relieves a lot of of the changes uh, that that you were talking about, or the demanding customers. Now, have we ever had a dud customer before that we were like, man, we're we're not we're not sad to see them leave? Sure, um, <laughs> sure. But but we spend a lot of time as just part of our process educating. You know, one of the things that that happens to a lot of folks is. Um, you know, depending upon when people are listening to to this, Meta just released a new social pro uh, platform. Um, mm -hmm. And so I guarantee you there are people saying, we need to be on that. Um, yep. And and <laughs> we have really spent a lot of time um, backing people away from things like that. Um, and and not because they're because we don't like them or we think they're silly. Um, but if, until something really demonstrates that it's going to be a, a practical approach, it's going to actually be a better way for us to serve our customers or for our customers to serve their customers and clients. Um, we are very, we're very pragmatic uh, mm -hmm. about, you know, the idea of the week rather than trying to rush to be, you know, first movers, uh, you know, on, on every <laughs> single thing that's out there. And I, I think that, you know, when we talk about trust, I mean, I, I do think that uh, a lot of businesses have been burned. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I hate to pick on, yes. I hate to pick on the SEO industry, but it's a pretty easy one to pick on, um, yeah. you know. And so once once you start telling people, no, you don't need to do that, or you know, we'll let you know when this is a, a big deal. You know, we just went through uh, again. Depending upon when people are listening to this, uh, good old uh, Google uh, uh, Google yeah. Analytics four. Yes. Um, you know, and and I mean, we you know we were telling our clients about it a year ago, uh, mm -hmm. saying, look, we're doing this for you. Uh, don't worry about <laughs> you know understanding it. You know, we'll get to that point, but just know you know we're doing it because um, it makes sense. And so I think that you know the, the, our clients tend to rest easy because they know we're constantly doing things like that for them. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And and it does create that sense of um, safety, which leads to trust, right? So I really love that. My my longest retainer clients uh, I've had since 2004. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's a, an amazing accolade. Um, and it just it, speaks to what you're saying here. In fact, it's the owner's son. I'm on the second generation. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. What a testament to what you do. Um, so you're an amazing trusted advisor. I'm wondering how do you or do you get pushback from in-house teams? Because, you know, we work with a lot of in-house teams with what we yeah. do in our line of work. And, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of a push and pull there. So how do in-house teams view you as a trusted advisor versus a vendor? There's one of two ways. They feel very threatened. I mean, that mm -hmm. does certainly happen. Um the, the other thing, though, that we've seen happen um, is that they're not really getting direction. <laughs> um, oh. And all of a sudden, they're like, thank God, I've been telling them we need a strategy. We need a plan. Um, so it, it seems to go one of, you know, some people are just, you know, thankful um, for it, you know, but but certainly there are some people that feel like, wait, are you here to replace me or I should mm -hmm. be doing what they've hired you to do? Um, so... Uh, you know, sometimes you can smooth those over. Uh, obviously, you can win people over. Um, sometimes you can't. I mean, it, it doesn't mm -hmm. hurt. I'm not going to lie that, you know, people can pick up a book I've written, uh, you know, and, and say, oh, okay, well, this is, you know, this person seems to know what they're talking about, you know, rather than just like, here's the flavor of the month. <laughs> No, I love that. And let's 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 go down a rabbit hole a little bit on that. Do you feel like things change it changed or got like easier once you started writing books to become the trusted advisor? Because I feel like there's a, a weight that books carry. Yeah. There's no question. I mean, in a lot of areas, I mean, I, you know, my speaking fees tripled. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly um leads, you know, would come out of, you know, they'd read the book and they'd hunt us down. I mean, uh, there's no question. I mean, it didn't hurt that the book sold. Uh, my first book, Duct Tape Marketing, sold quite well and the referral engine sold quite well. Um, and so, you know, that that obviously, you know, can lead to, you know, long-term success in terms of, you know, people 
some amount of people finding that and deciding they 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 want to work with you. You know, we right. we've uh, licensed uh, about to date about four hundred agencies and and wow. you know consultants on our methodology um, that that I outline in duct tape marketing and and you know that that licensing you know component of our business and and network uh, you know really is largely due to the to to the books in many ways. Okay, so now I have a question about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me a little bit more about the 400 agencies that you've licensed. Yeah. Like, explain that. So, so we have, you know, we've been talking a little bit about it, but we have what I think is a fairly unique approach. I mean, when we have a discovery meeting with a client, our goal is to sell them a 60 day strategy first engagement for a price. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of that uh, deliverable, we are going to sell them into a long term retainer, which uh, involves a very set process of, of stages, you know, foundation, level up, organize. You know, we have, we have scripted that out, you know, completely because let's face it. 80% uh, of businesses out there need 80% of the same thing, whether they know it or not. <laughs> uh, and so we're able to really um, document our process and script out our process. And so um, we started uh, attracting, you know, especially since the first book came out, we started attracting other, um, I, I say agencies, that's one of, that's a loose term anymore. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, they're, yeah. you know, they're, we have solopreneurs, you know, that call themselves agencies um, that, that want, basically want to license some amount of our brand that they're licensing, but but it's really the tools and the processes that we've built and the positioning, you know, around how to, to actually sell strategy um, and then how to implement it. We've also built a very large uh, strategic partner base of content writers and social media folks and SEO folks and web designers. And so um, we're actually able to provide implementation teams, you know, to a lot of uh, the folks that, that license our methodology. So we've really, you know, we have people that are in total startup mode and we have people that have built nice businesses but they're you know they're they're not making enough money sure. uh, uh, they're working harder than they want to be working and all <laughs> of a sudden now you know our system and our process our package let's face it our package allows them to charge more uh, which allows them to actually delegate a great deal of the work um, and so they're able to scale um, you know something that seems uh, you know a fractional CMO practice seems very hard to scale but because we've built so much scope around it um, we've actually shown people how to do that. That's great. I love that idea. Like just teaching others, right? How to be successful. Just yeah, it's, like you are. It's 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 obviously it's been financially lucrative, but it's also been a great way to impact thousands and thousands of businesses. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's wonderful. Um so I want going back to the strategy. You said it's about a 60-day run. How much of an understanding do you need to to achieve within that 60 days of your client's industry and business goals and challenging and and how does that work into then obviously you sure. becoming a vendor to a trust advisor <laughs> well um I think the biggest thing is it, it is just still shocking to me how little people understand about their customers. Um, and so, you know, we're not necessarily talking about startups. I mean, we, our sweet spot is really that company that wants to go to the next level. Mm -hmm. You know, they've been outwardly successful, but they've really not had any kind of systematic approach to marketing. And so, you know, the founder has sold all, it, all they can sell. Right. And so now they realize, okay, we have to get serious about this. So, the, the discoveries we make about their customers, the discoveries we make about the real problems they solve, which which become their core message and their core point of differentiation, um, that buys us so much trust because nobody else is doing it at, at the level that, that that we're providing to them. So all of a sudden, to, for us to be able to share uh, with them about what they do, you know, that the market really appreciates and that how they could actually clearly differentiate themselves, you know, that's that's a gold mine there. I mean, that's, that buys us 90 days, you know, <laughs> right there because uh, nobody, you know, unfortunately nobody's been talking to them about that. We mm -hmm. then actually create um, a, a what, what is still for us a proprietary approach to developing their customer journey. Uh, something I call the marketing hourglass, which again reveals, you know, so many things, not in just how to generate business, how to generate more profitable business, how to retain more business. You know, I've written a lot about referrals. That's a big part yeah. of our, our customer journey that we develop for them. 
So all of a sudden now we've gotten into their business model, you know, completely. We, and we've just revealed so many gaps uh, that they have in their in their overall marketing. Um, uh, next step we do is to create a, a very strategic approach to content. Everybody knows content is really sort of, um, you know, table stakes to, to do marketing today, but so many people are just throwing content out there for content's sake. Mm -hmm. um, we show them an actual editorial approach to content that's going to uh, move the needle. Um, and then we help develop the priorities that we that we believe are going to be the most important places to focus for the next 60, 90, 120 days. Awesome. We, I, I have another question. <laughs> we had a previous episode with um, Samantha Stone, and she was talking about these it's really a sales and marketing playbook that she builds, mm -hmm. but it's it's really understanding and doing the research for your you know ideal customer profile. Is that you kind bet. of what you're talking about? A absolutely. We do a ton of that. We do competitive research. We look at the industry for opportunities, threats, um, and and um, um, trends. Uh, so we're you know it, it's it's funny. I mean it's it's work that educates us uh, clearly, especially if it's an industry we haven't done that much work in, but. It, it's, per, you know, we talk about this trust building, um, it, you know, going back to a client and, and sharing with them even some things they might know or be aware of, um, but then demonstrating that we know <laughs> and are aware of, I think uh -huh. really goes a long way towards, uh, towards establishing that level of trust. Plus, I, you know, I hate to say it, but a lot of marketers are afraid to talk about revenue. Um, and profit. And, and we dig very much into where, you know, the gaps are of where they are today from where they want to be. Um, and I think that, I think business owners, you know, a lot of times when I'm training other consultants, they'll say, well, gosh, you know, I, I hate to get into the numbers. Like, what if they don't want to tell you? So like, if they don't want to tell you, then they don't want to work with you, <laughs> um, you know, because we have to know that. I mean, how do we, how are we going to measure success here? So we ask them hard questions about their business and about their growth and about um, the constraints and, and about the gaps. And I think that that goes a long way towards them saying, okay, if I'm going to tell you all that, then you are going to be my trusted advisor. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And then how, what's your recommendation for yourself, like for agency owners listening? And then what's your recommendation for agency owners and their clients on revamping that work that you're doing right there? Like how often should we re revisit that strategy? Well, we, you know, I'm not suggesting we change messaging very often. We hope we nail that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, we obviously are open to changing it, but we, we are looking at the strategic priorities every quarter. Uh, we run people through a process where we allow them to identify together two, uh, three at the most priorities for the quarter of what needs to be done next. Mm. Now, you know, projects fall from that, uh, tasks fall from that. But again, we want to focus all of our work that quarter on achieving a couple priorities in marketing that we believe will roll up to their business overarching business priorities. Um, and that doesn't mean we don't have a bunch of other things in the works that we're, you know, constantly working on. Sure. Um, but, you know, we're, we, our approach, uh, you know, taking the long-term, you know, view rather than sort of the event <laughs> view, like a, like a lot of people do, a lot of business owners do with their marketing, mm -hmm. you know, has us actually say, look, we, you know, for this budget or for this retainer, this is what we can accomplish. Um, you know, obviously we can, we can visit if you want to ramp it up and do it faster then you know, we can create another plan. Um, but, we know that it, when people try to do everything all at once, first off, there's sort of a linear approach to these things. You know, we have clients all the time. It's like, we need to run ads and send them where? <laughs> <laughs> right? Where are they going? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, we need to build your website in a way that's actually going to make those people that show up there want to do something. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is kind of a li linear progression to this. And we, we show them what the linear progression is. We show them what we call the customer success track. Um, and, and, you know, hopefully that, you know, well, it generally does do the trick of kind of buying us the time to do what we need to do in the, in the, in the order in which it needs to be done. I love that advice because I forget where I heard it, but like, I think it was on a podcast. Warren Buffett was saying, you know, somebody asked like, how do we get to be the next Warren Buffett? And he basically said, you know, I want you to write down all the goals that you have right. in your case for this quarter. Everybody writes a list down and he's like, now I want you to pick the top three or that are the most important to you. Everybody picks out the top three. And he's like, now pick the top out of those three that's important to you and trash everything else. Focus yeah. on that one thing. Right. So I love that advice that you have on just really getting like granular with focus because a lot of times 
right? Our clients can be a little all over the place. It's because they don't know what they want, right? Well, and it's so easy to get distracted by all the stuff that seems important. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, I mean, if when 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 we get, and this goes for team members too, <laughs> when we get them asking, you know, when a client says we should do X, um, what this does for us is allows us to go, okay, where would that fit in here? You know, yeah. how, how yeah. would that fit in? How would that roll up to a priority that we already said we were committed to? It's like, so okay, smart. I guess we don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> so smart. So smart. I love it. All right. So we've been talking about, you know, what you've been doing for the past 30 years. And it sounds like a fairy tale, but certainly there have been a monster here or there. So can you tell us about a time that maybe there was a client pushback or a challenge that you had and you were able to overcome that and still, you know, remain the trusted advisor because we all have those monsters show up somewhere along the path. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to answer the question directly, but I think this is, uh, I think this is going to get to the point. Um, early on in my career, um, one of the things that, you know, like a lot of people, if somebody said they'd pay me, I was like, great, we'll do the work. You know, uh-huh. you, I'm your guy. Um, and I, long story short, um, I ended up in front of a grand jury uh, oh. testifying because a client had been doing some really shady things. Oh. And uh, now, fortunately, I had nothing really uh, sure. useful to share. Uh, but did I know that maybe there were some weird things going on there? Um, you know, yes. <laughs> um, and it, it really was a, uh, to me, it was a watershed moment for my business and maybe the body of my work I produced after that because it really did, um, it really did make me um, realize that you have to focus on attracting the right clients. You have to focus on um, working with, uh, it, it, you know, at that time I was a small firm, right? Uh, you have to work, have to focus on working with people that, you know, share your values that, that you believe you bring yeah. value to uh, that, you know, have the right problem and the right um, ability to solve the problem that you can solve um, rather than just taking work. I mean, I, you know, I've, probably turned down more work in the last 10 years um, than, than, you know, taken uh, because it just wasn't a fit. And, and I know, and what that, what I think a lot of times um, not having the right client fit does Mm -hmm. is not only does it drive us crazy. I I think we, (laughs) we fail to, uh, we fail to estimate the opportunity loss um, in serving clients that are not profitable, that are, you know, that kind of run your team ragged. Um, Then we're not, we can't focus on the work that we not only enjoy, but, but that that client really values what we do. Cause I, I, you know, I've, in my last book, I wrote about this idea that I think the top 20% of most businesses clients uh, would do 10 times more business with them. If we focused on those folks, if we focus not only on serving them and thrilling them, but focus on what else they need, mm-hmm. how else we could, you know, grow with them. Um, and it'd be a lot more satisfying than kind of chasing those people that, you know, want to deal. I, yes, that's such great advice. And so now I'm wondering, how do you know if it's the right client? Like, do you put your potential clients through like a rigorous onboarding process or an intake form or how does that work? So part of, I think how you do it is, is all of your marketing messaging. Um, you know, one of the things I learned early on is that clients that invest in their community, that invest in their industry are probably going to be a good fit for us. It's just Mm. a mentality. It's an investor mentality. That's what we want. A long-term relationship is an investor mentality. So, so there are some things that you can actually see, um, that, you know, that you can measure, right. Those types of things. But also we talk a lot about that being, you know, a, a value that, that businesses should do that. Um, that, that, that's a, you know, a very valuable way to grow and any, any, a lot of, the plans that we create, you know, are always going to be around investing in your community, being involved in your industry. And so I think that's one of the ways that we subtly or not, you know, attract kind of what we think is going to be a fit. So rather than having this rigorous, um, you know, interview process, uh-huh. um, you know, we, we certainly are looking into things that are going to be red flags. Um, we do we do educational discovery uh, mesh- uh, meetings. You know, there are certain things that, that you know, if somebody shows up with, um, you know, at, at meeting with five people that, uh, you know, nobody told us they were you know, going to be there. I mean, just things, subtle things like that. Um, you know, we've probably learned over the years, you know, to, to view as red flags. But sure. I think a lot of it is 
our package and our messaging, you know, attracts the right folks. And then a lot of our um, educational content that we put out is really aimed um, at somebody who would agree, <laughs> you know, with that point of view, who is probably going to be a good ideal client. Yeah, I think that's so smart. I talk a lot about that. You know, people are scared, or I should say brands are scared to be vulnerable, right? And share their values and uh, mission and, yes. and, and core, you know, strengths that they have are things that they side with. But I think when you do that, like you're saying, you actually attract better customers, right? Because they're aligning their values with yours. Very, very much so. Very much so. All right. So I have to mention AI for the third time. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you see the role of technology, not just AI, but technology yeah. transforming the marketing agency's position from a vendor to a trusted advisor? Do we think that AI is going to really make it harder for people to become trusted advisors because of the way the tool works? No, I think it's actually going to make it more important <laughs> that you become that uh, because unfortunately, you know, there's, you've seen them all the, all the people out there selling the, you know, do your marketing with chat GPT and, you know, three yeah. easy steps for $19. <laughs> um, and so, you know, try, trying to actually ignore that <laughs> um, or trying to get in that fray, you know, is really going to be an issue. And I think it's actually, I think, it, of course, I've always fought, strategy is very important. But now I think being a strategist, positioning yourself as a strategist, that's really the only, that's the only turf left, uh, you know, quite frankly, you know, to, to really establish yourself, establish yourself as a trusted advisor, unless you've, you know, come up with some tactic that's just going to instantly mint money for people. And, and by the way, it'll be obsolete in 60 days. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you've really got to, uh, you've got to focus on positioning yourself as, as something different. And I really think, you know, owning the strategy uh, component, even though there is a percentage of the market that's, that doesn't want it or thinks they don't want it or thinks they don't need it, um, you mm -hmm. will attract um, uh, the right client and you will establish the right relationship. As far as AI goes, um, you know, you have to be participating in it. You have to understand it. Every one of your clients is going to be asking you about it, of mm -hmm. course. Um, but it's, it, it to, to, I don't think we're actually at, uh, I think we're in its infancy. I don't mm -hmm. think we're actually at artificial intelligence. I think we are at, I, I kiddingly say, I call it IA. It's informed automation. Uh -huh. I think it's where we are right now. I love that. <laughs> and what I mean by that is it's, it's like having a research assistant say, look, go find me this, go give me some ideas around this, go mm -hmm. give me some versions of this. And so, you know, if you're not using it, if, and there's mundane things, I mean, who likes to write metadata, right? For, you know, <laughs> for me. websites, right? Well, it does a really good job at that, actually. <laughs> it, it's ready for prime time to do that. So, so using it for tasks like that. But I will also tell you this that, um, and it's only going to get smarter. We are using it uh, to help inform strategy as well. Um, mm. It is very good at taking uh, a persona and turning it around into first person and giving you voice of customer. Um, so, like, what are the what are the things that, um, you know, Bob and Betty are saying before they were going to remodel their house, you know, while they're laying in bed at night and it will, it does a very good job at taking that pers those personas and actually saying, these are the 20 concerns that you need to be addressing. Fabulous advice on AI, not even on the topic. Look at you go. <laughs> All right. So last deep dive question. What one piece of advice for anybody who's listening or watching they're they're probably an agency owner and they want to transition from being, you know, the marketing vendor or the service provider to a trusted advisor sure. like you. Yeah. What would yeah. that one piece of advice be? Well, I'll tell you what it's been for me is have a consistent point of view and just stick with it. Don't bend to the whims, you know, say, look, this is, you know, this is what we believe. This is how we believe you'd be served. This is the way we can give you the most value. We call it a package, um, you know, by, by going, you know, with, with that message, you know, to the right market and, and showing them, telling them how you can solve their problem in a very specific way is how you really differentiate yourself from all the people that are just basically selling tactics uh, today. So, so develop that or buy it or whatever it is. I mean, obviously we license that, <laughs> that approach. So do whatever it is it takes to get that. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's what's going to be key, I think, to differentiating yourself in, in today's kind of crowded, you know, idea of the week market. 
Yeah, idea of the week. It's so true. Well, you've been fantastic. You gave so many great tips on how, you know, marketing agency owners can position themselves for longevity and great AI tips as well. <laughs> but tell everybody where they can find you, how they connect, sure. can connect with you, and then what you're working on as well. Sure. So pretty much everything I've been doing for the last couple of decades can be found at uh, Duct Tape Marketing, which is D-U-C-T. T-A-P-E, uh, marketing.com. I'm probably most active on on LinkedIn if, if you're looking to connect uh, that way or just John at ducttapemarketing.com too. I, uh, I still return the occasional email. <laughs> I know you return emails because you've, you're just as great. At, by the way, I've met John in person. He's just as great in person as he is here <laughs> on the interwebs. So thank you again so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Really solid advice. And hopefully we'll get to have you back. Oh, thanks, Brooke. This is fun.